I am a Deputy Solicitor General in the Florida Office of the Attorney General, and it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for our next panel on the Florida Separation of Powers. And I can tell you one thing, uh, I uh, have just gotten to know uh, Judge Barber uh, very recently, and uh, I can infer from the length of the bio that he has asked me to read that he is a very humble, humble man, uh, and I intend fully to stick uh, to that bio. Uh, so without further ado, Tom Barber is a circuit judge in Tampa, where he has served since 2004. He was appointed to the Hillsborough County Circuit Court, or to the Hillsborough County Court, by Governor Jeb Bush, and then to the Circuit Court by Governor Charlie Crist. He has presided over cases in all of the Circuit Court's subject matter areas, except juvenile, and he has been elected unopposed three times. Judge Barber. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, standing up here, you may not know from that end of the equation, these lights are very bright, and all of our panelists feel like they're under the um, kind of interrogation of the uh, KGB or something. We're going to tell everything. So you can get a lot of good information out of them if you want. Um, my name's Tom Barber, and I want to thank Jordan um, for these panels don't get put together just by showing up. There's a lot of backroom uh, work that goes into it, and Jordan's been the person that's really done that. So him and another individual who happens to be sitting right beside him, Dan Woodring, really put this thing together. So I extend my thanks in advance, because I think it's going to be a good panel because of the work they've done. Um, what we're going to do is a panel on separation of powers. Separation of powers is um, one of the fundamental aspects of our American system of government. And that's a term we kind of learn in middle school civics classes. And we, we think of it as the difference between the legislative, executive, and judicial powers. And each one is supposed to stay in its own lane. Um, and that's certainly something we're going to be speaking about, or the panelists are going to be speaking about today. They wanted to start, though, in a little bit different place. And that is the idea we've called, called this vertical separation of powers, meaning the relationships between federal, state, local, and sub-local government actors. So we're going to have a focus on that. It's something a little different, and we'll probably will circle back into the more um, normal separation of powers uh, disputes, and we've certainly had uh, our share of those in Florida, and that will come up at some point. I am a big believer in questions, though. So um, this panel hopefully will end in a, in a point where we can ask some questions. And I look forward to, to entertaining those questions. So the panel, our first panelist is our Solicitor General, Amit Argwal. He was appointed Solicitor General in June 2016. It's the position that was established back in 1999, and it's patterned after the US Office of the Solicitor General, which conducts litigation on behalf of the United States at the US Supreme Court. The Solicitor General of Florida serves three roles, overseeing civil appeals involving the state's interests in all state and federal appellate courts, teaching at the Florida State University College of Law, where he holds the Richard W. Irvin Eminent Scholar Chair, and serving as a policy advisor to the Attorney General. Amith served as Deputy Chief to the Appellate Division of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of Florida before being named Solicitor General, and previously he clerked at the United States Supreme Court for Justice Samuel Alito and served as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice. Additionally, he served as a law clerk for the Honorable Brett Kavanaugh on the Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and the Honorable Ed Becker of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in Philadelphia. I also am a believer in um, maybe adding a little levity to things and giving you a fun fact about each speaker. Um, all of these speakers have fun facts, but Amith's fun fact is he used to work for Book TV. Is that right? That's right. All right. <laughs> Our next speaker, Mann Downs, former president of the Florida Bar. She's now president and managing director of Gray Robinson, the first woman to hold that position. She has served as president of the Orange County Bar Association, the Legal Aid Society, and the Florida Bar. She graduated at the top of her class at the University of Florida and held two senior editorial positions on the Law Review, and she's a member of the University of Florida Hall of Fame and Florida Blue Key. She has served for 10 years as the city attorney for Orlando, the first woman to be appointed, and is also a member of the Judicial Qualifications Commission 
which disciplines judges. So I am very nice to her. <laughs> she is the proudest of being the first female managing partner of a major law firm in the Southeast United States, and she's the single parent of Barry, a Nashville musician, and Savannah, a third generation UF law student. Her fun fact is she grew up with a pet, Llama. And she recently returned from a trip to Sri Lanka. Guess the name of the llama. Dali. Dali Lama. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Very creative. Our next speaker is um, Katziano. <laughs> she currently resides in the Washington, D.C. area, working as a senior counsel for Uber Technologies, where she is Uber's regulatory lead for the East Coast of the United States. Prior to Uber, she served at I360 LLC as general counsel, and before that, she worked in weapons law at a boutique firm in Washington, D.C. She's also spent time at the Institute for Justice and at Fox Business News. Kat attended undergrad and business school at the University of Florida. Go Gators. She went on to earn her JD from the George Mason University School of Law, which is now the Antonin Scalia School of Law. What is her fun fact? Not very creative here. She's a fan of Disney, and she's looking forward to going to the parks after this uh, event is concluded. Anyone know, would like to join her? To join me at the park. She <laughs> needs somebody to go with her. So anybody that needs somebody to go with, CAD is open. Lastly, we have Dan Nordby, who is the general counsel for Florida Governor Rick Scott. Before joining the administration, Dan practiced law in the areas of appellate and constitutional litigation at the Tallahassee office of Schutz and Bowen. He has previously served as general counsel to the Florida House of Representatives under Speaker Will Weatherford, general counsel to Florida Secretary of State, and general counsel to the Republican Party of Florida. Now, Dan's fun fact is like me, he doesn't have any. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. Each speaker is going to speak for about seven minutes, and we're going to start with Ameth. Thank you. I, I don't believe that for a second. Yeah. There's no fun fact, so we might have to talk to Rachel about that later. Uh, thank you so much, Judge Barber, for the introductions and for moderating this event. And thanks so much to the Federal Society for organizing this wonderful conference, for your kindness in inviting me back. Uh, I'm pleased that a good number of the attorneys who serve in the office of the Solicitor General are here today. Uh, it'll give you a sense of kind of the respect and the esteem that the folks in our office have for the Federal Society and for the important principles that you espouse. So thank you so much to the Federal Society. And if you don't mind, I, I was hoping that I could just introduce some of my folks, Rachel uh, Nordby and Jordan Pratt and Ed Wenger, if you guys wouldn't mind just standing up for just a second. If you had, ha haven't had a chance to, to meet them yet, yeah. They are, and I mean this with all sincerity, the most phenomenally talented and dedicated attorneys that I've ever had the privilege of serving with, and I'm so grateful to them. I learn so much from them every single day, um, and grateful to them for the extraordinary contributions they make to the work of our office uh, and for being here today. And I see some of my former colleagues at the U.S. Attorney's Office who are kind of fairly scowling up at me right now. Um, guys, to quote one of my heroes, Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid, you're pretty okay too. So. <laughs> So I, w I was asked to provide a kind of broad overview of some important separ Florida separation of powers issues that have been percolating through the state courts over the course of the last year. And I think that, you know, I was thinking about it, I think you can kind of broadly divide all those issues into three categories. Uh, incidentally, my wife always complains that when we talk that, you know, I argue like an attorney and that I make my points in numbered form. And she said, you know, she said, one, you got to stop doing that. And yeah. <laughs> she said, two, if, yeah, if you're going to do it, then she's absolutely cutting me off at five points because she said, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'm out. So uh, out, of, out of respect for my wife, I'm limiting my points today to three. Right? It's a manageable number. Right? So three broad categories of important Florida separation of powers issues that at least the office of the Florida Solicitor General has, has seen over the course of the last year. And the first, I think, deals with the distribution of power between the Florida legislature and not so much the Florida judiciary in general, but the Florida Supreme Court. And the specific issue here is whether various state statutes impermissibly infringe on the Florida Supreme Court's authority to make procedural rules 
governing the conduct of judicial proceedings. And I see some eyes glazing over and people looking up at me like, I could be at Disney World right now, and why are you talking about this on a Saturday morning? That sounds really boring. It, it might sound boring. Uh, it might not sound as sexy as kind of some of the issues that you read about, constitutional law type issues that you read about in the newspapers. I will tell you that in my view, uh, this is a question of absolutely enormous practical significance for the day-to-day -day administration of civil and criminal justice. And let me just give you a couple examples of, of how this issue comes up. Uh, there's one set of challenges to a recent amendment to the Stand Your Ground law that many of you might be familiar with. And this is an amendment that essentially says if you're a defendant in a criminal case, and you, know, you stand up and say, criminal proceeding, you stand up and say, I didn't do it. And by the way, I did it in self-defense. Right? Uh, <laughs> That's, okay, I didn't get the reaction that I was hoping for there, but <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad joke. That's my former, you know, my former status as a former federal prosecutor coming out. It's a little bit too harsh. But so, you know, the defendant stands up and says, I acted in self-defense. And what do you do with that for purposes of a pretrial immunity claim under the Stand Your Ground statute? And, and the answer is a lot really turns at the end of the day on who has the burden of proof and what exactly is the standard of evidentiary proof. And so this recent amendment provides that in these types of pretrial immunity hearings, uh, that if the defendant makes out a, a prima facie case, then the burden shifts to the prosecution to establish by clear and convincing evidence uh, that the defendant is not entitled to stand your ground immunity. And various trial courts have held, the trial courts are divided, but you know, some trial judges have held that this statute impermissibly infringes on the Florida Supreme Court's exclusive authority to promulgate procedural rules. And we know, you know, we know from what trial judges have told us that a lot of these, in a lot of these cases, whether that new amendment applies is going to be outcome determinative. So that's an important issue, obviously, for criminal prosecutors, for criminal defendants, and has public safety implications as well. And another example of a kind of a type of case in which that plays out, there's a case called Delisle versus Crane, which is currently pending before the Florida Supreme Court, uh, in which there's a similar sort of challenge to a state statute that tells trial judges that you should be following the Daubert standard for purposes of determining the admissibility of expert scientific testimony and evidence. And so again, you know, the kind of thing that might not seem kind of all that exciting as some of the constitutional law type issues we hear about, but enormous practical significance for the administration of justice. That's category one. Uh, category two is distribution of power between, you could say, the Florida judiciary in general and the political branches of government with respect to their role in the appropriations process. And you know, just very briefly, we've seen a number of cases over the course of the last year in which litigants have essentially asked courts to rule that the legislature is not appropriating enough money to satisfy very statu various statutory and constitutional requirements and or that the governor should not be able to exercise his veto power without purportedly a sufficient justification. And so this, these are obviously very important uh, issues insofar as they implicate what might seem to be quintessentially legislative and executive powers, uh, whether you pass a law or not, whether you pass an appropriation or not, whether the governor vetoes that appropriation or not, and the extent to which the judiciary can control those determinations and regulate it, uh, uh, even for purposes of vindicating statutory and constitutional rights, obviously a very big separation of powers issue. That's one to look out for over the course of the next year. And the third category is the one that Judge Barber emphasized in his introduction, and that is vertical separation of powers. So you know, distribution of authority between the state government on the one hand and local communities on the other. You know, the Solicitor General's office has been involved recently in defending various state statutes that preempt certain kinds of local regulation, local regulation of polystyrene products on the part of food service establishments, local regulation of minimum wages. And I understand that uh, some of my fellow panelists are going to be talking about those issues, so I won't, I won't talk too much about that. Uh, you know, one interesting vertical type separation of powers case that our office dealt with over the course of the last year was a case called Ayala versus Scott, uh, which uh, involved, I think some of you might have heard about it, it got a lot of attention last year, and basically it involved a state attorney who shortly after she was elected announced that she would not be seeking the death penalty in any of the cases to be handled in her office. Excuse me. And in response, Governor Scott reassigned pending capital cases in that state attorney's office to the office of a neighboring state attorney. Uh, and at that point, the resident state attorney 
filed an emergency application for a petition for a writ of quo in the Florida Supreme Court. So for those of you who are not that familiar with Florida practice, this is kind of something that you can do in Florida. You can go directly to the Florida Supreme Court with respect to a huge question of kind of public law. And that was, you know, for me coming from the federal system, that was kind of a novelty and it's kind of an interesting aspect of state practice that you can do that. But in any event, it went to the Florida Supreme Court. And long story short, uh, I don't want to take too, too much time up, the, the court last summer by a, a vote of five to two ruled that the challenged executive reassignments uh, comported with the requirement of the separation of powers and were valid. And uh, you know, the court kind of emphasized two facts in particular. Uh, one was uh, that these there was evidence in the record that the governor in this case was not really purporting to micromanage the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. Uh, and the second fact that the court really seemed to put a lot of emphasis on was, in its, you know, in its words, what the court characterized as the blanket, kind of across the board nature of the policy that was articulated by the state attorney. And so that's a case that I think is endlessly fascinating. It implicates, uh, in some ways, kind of an unusual difference, an important difference between the Florida separation of powers and the federal separation of powers, and that is, of course, the fact that we have a plural executive. You know, we have a system in which uh, you have executive power not just vested in one person, but vested in a governor, uh, but also in other constitutional officers who are independently elected, the attorney general and locally elected state attorneys. And so that's one of kind of the interesting separation of powers aspects of that case. But I, I could go on and on about that. I don't want to take up uh, too much time because I know that you all are eager to hear from my fellow panelists, as am I. But you know, bottom line is this is a really exciting time for Florida separation of powers. It's not something you hear about that much in the news, but with respect to the three categories of cases that I talked about, I think we can fairly expect some really important doctrinal and jurisprudential developments over the course of the next year. Thank you. Uh, before, before we go on to the next uh, speaker, just wanted to mention, I told Ameth I would say this and I forgot. Um, any, anything that is said here today are strictly the opinions of the speakers. They're not speaking on behalf of their clients or their agencies. Um, they are just they're giving their personal views, all right? So that, um, same thing with pending cases. Obviously, we can't talk about pending cases. So um, I should have said that at the beginning, and my apologies. Mayanne, you're up next. Well, uh, my focus is I was asked to speak today on separation of powers, and I, I think the vertical distinction is a, is a helpful one. Um, and it certainly resonates with us because we're down at the bottom. The, uh, uh, everybody can preempt uh, a city. Um, and so we understand and appreciate that. And I, I want to uh, mention a couple of things from the perspective of local government. But I have to also comment about the Ayala case because it was so very personal uh, to those of us in Central Florida. Uh, you know, there was an odd convergence of events that began with uh, Florida's death penalty being temporarily invalidated at the time of an election, which allowed a candidate to sidestep uh, uh, letting the electorate know uh, what the philosophy of that state attorney uh, operation would be under that candidate's uh, charge. Um, and I would say, parenthetically, there was a failure of our press uh, to press that point home. Um, and so as a result, the announcement of what would happen in the cases in our home, our hometown, came um, in connection with uh, a person uh, in the city of Orlando after Pulse, we don't name criminals unless we have to. We don't say their names, so I won't say his name, but he stopped uh, clearly fleeing, able to escape without any question because the officer who had the courage to, uh, while off duty, try to apprehend him was down on the ground uh, and able to uh, act. He stopped and turned around and executed her, having not very long uh, a time before that, executed his girlfriend who was eight and a half months pregnant. So that was the crime, which you can imagine was a source of a great deal of public uh, anguish. Uh, this Orlando Police Department officer was a wonderful person, beloved in her community. And so the, the um, angst of that horrible crime then connected up with 
we're not going to do the death penalty here in the Ninth Circuit was something that was, was uh, just a very, very important issue. And so while it didn't directly involve the city of Orlando, uh, on behalf of our police department, we were very happy that uh, there was an appropriate mechanism to address, and that's the way we felt. It wasn't so much discretion in a particular case, although this one was extraordinarily heinous, it was the blanket statement of, we're just gonna wipe this off the boards, notwithstanding what the law of Florida is. So uh, that, was, that was a case that, while it's not typical of what we see from a preemption standpoint, it was one we watched uh, very closely and very carefully. So from the standpoint of local government, look, we know um, our uh, dreams, goals, life ambitions are gonna be clipped <laughs> upward, we get it. We really just want to know uh, when we've be pre been preempted. Say so. Uh, it's very, very hard at the local level, because remember, the local level is where you get your permit or you don't. The local level is where law enforcement rolls out and meets individuals. So the concept in Tallahassee or Washington is a beautiful thing. We are the ones charged with the real life ramification. And in the context particularly of land use, and of course land use intersects with, of course we wanna save our waterways, right? Of course we wanna be respect, uh, respectful and uh, cognizant of the impact of land use decisions. Uh, but a city and a county and other units of local government has the very difficult spot of being sued if we don't give the permit and if you know we do give the permit someone else will sue us and we have a case right now and judge barber is right it's not i won't go into detail about it except i will say um, that when you step back and look at a macro level of what does our society want to do, what protections are appropriate, and yet don't go too far and infringe on the liberty and pursuit of happiness and all those uh, constitutional um, mandates that this group particularly holds dear, um, where do you have to regulate beyond the local level, for example, for use of land, uh, and where does it go too far? And the Wakaiva River Protection Act is one that we struggle with. And where we struggle with it is that at local MPB hearings, municipal planning boards, peopled by lay people, uh, peopled by lawyers who may be tax lawyers uh, and attended to by staff. We're fortunate. I have 25 lawyers at the city of Orlando. We have a, we have a big staff. We're a reasonably big government. But I think about the town of Bellevue or Brooksville and how do they navigate through the very difficult world in which uh, state protection of waterways, everyone would agree that's a laudable goal, uh, but when it impacts our ability to or limitation upon how land will be used, we're the ones who have to struggle with that and we're the ones who get sued. Uh, while the courts, if the um, intent to preempt is not expressed, have to struggle with what exactly did the legislature intend. So we say from the local government, uh, I love Judge Scales' quote in the December 2017 Retail Federation case out of the third DCI. I love Judge Scales anyway. And that's really the reason I went on the, the JQC to protect him from what I was sure would be a flood of complaints. <laughs> um, it, it hasn't turned out that way, shockingly, but um, uh, that was a case about the minimum wage and the interplay, of course, between the uh, state uh, minimum wage statute and the constitutional amendment that kind of bizarrely sought to do something that it said it wasn't gonna do, um, and uh, a city's uh, weighing in on this. And the quote was, there is no better perspective on intent, preemptive intent, uh, than from the explicit text at issue. So uh, I would say to those of you in a position to adjudicate or legislate, uh, preemptively, uh, if you're going to occupy the area, say so and tell us what it is you intend. My, my final comment is 
um, akin to land use, which is where, as I said, we see this intersection between a laudable state goal preemption and how do we deal with our local, uh, local uh, struggles. I'll tell you what consumes a lot of our time is marijuana. Um, we are mandated to give dispensary permits uh, whether we think that's a good idea or not at the city of Orlando, whether our local citizens like that idea in their neighborhood, everybody knows that, right? NIMBY, it's a great idea, not in my backyard. Um, so w what we think about that is immaterial, that is the law. And yet, the interplay that we see involves banks. Um, where is the money? that is involved with the use, distribution, manufacture um, of marijuana, a substance that is illegal at all levels, at the federal level, uh, where's the money gonna go when that uh, dispensary permit holder opens up and collects cash? Where does that cash go? Uh, some banks are saying, yeah, nope, don't bring it in here, we can't. Uh, navigate through that issue between uh, local, state, and federal. So, uh, just in summary, we're the ones where the proverbial rubber meets the road, and more than anything, we would like clarity, and that's why we always will vote for express intent. Thank you. Um, we need to clarify something else which just came up. Although Mayanne may be spending a lot of time with marijuana, the rest of us on the panel are not. Uh, um, Kat Siano is up next. The fun no! <laughs> the fun facts aren't that fun. <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me. This is my first time at this conference, um, but I will not miss it again. I was joking earlier that I've gone native because 52 degrees is warm for me and I'm bare arms yeah. in this weather. <laughs> um, We've so got I'm, jackets. I'm from D.C. now, right. apparently, after having spent a lot of years here. Um, so uh, I'm talking about a little bit the, uh, the vertical separation of powers um, from the business perspective. Um, I've been uh, with Uber almost two years um, and it's been a really interesting time to watch uh, the company um, grow um, but also to see authorization happen in so many states. Uh, when I first came in I was heading up uh, the Northeast regs. We passed nine state laws uh, in 2016 um, and, um, and so it's been really interesting working with not just uh, local regulators and local attorneys um, but also working through the process and the way the democratic uh, process actually winds up working out. Uh, there's no formula for what the right level of government uh, should be for any type of uh, any type of regulation. Um, it often winds up being a back and forth um, where all stakeholders are involved trying to figure out which pieces need to be incorporated, which pieces don't need to be incorporated, um, and how most appropriately to regulate uh, whatever the activity is in question. Um, and the goal that we have, um, just like I think um, most uh, local and state people have, is to make sure that we're balancing safety, uh, opportunity, um, and the perspectives of all the stakeholders who are involved. Um, so I'll, my, my three categories that I'll talk about are, uh, first of all, separation of powers generally, especially when it comes to uh, preemptive laws, um, and then uh, Uber's perspective and our experience, and then finally the business and how uh, business and separation of powers tends to interact. Um, so starting, um, preemptive, preemptive laws um, are trending in a lot of places and in a lot of areas. Um, I think a big reason why they're trending, um, from my perspective, has been the sharing economy and tech um, obviously is looking for as much uh, uniform uh, regulatory environment as possible. It just makes it easier to invest, to expand, um, and also especially in a sharing economy environment when the investment isn't just from the business, but it's also from the individuals who are making an investment in an asset that they'll be sharing, uh, they need to know what the laws are and that they won't be shifting. Um, so there winds up being a double-sided double investment that needs to be protected there. Um, so part of why I think the, so part of the reason why I think preemptive laws are, are trending is because of the sharing economy and tech generally, um, but also because I think there's been a bit of a tipping point um, on occupational licensing. I know we're talking about that from tons of perspectives this weekend. I know that uh, the Federal Society tends to have a fairly uniform perspective on how occupational licensing uh, could and should uh, work or be improved. 
Um, but it's been interesting because I think that the reason why it had been on the rise was to address some safety issues that weren't being addressed in a better way at the state level. And so there wound up being much more local control. And then the people who wound up taking those uh, controlling uh, positions were people who were more engaged and more knowledgeable about the occupations in question. And then, of course, there winds up in many <coughs> instances being a protectionist aspect to what that occupational licensing looks like. But everyone is, by and large, acting from a good place. Um, and so part of what we've always tried to do is when we come in and we're making these types of um, negotiations and trying to make sure that we're representing stakeholder interests, that we're hearing the safety aspects, that it's not just a matter of saying, you know, taxis have one, um, one agenda and it's different from our agenda. It's much more a matter of trying to make sure that we're representing safety for riders and for drivers and, of course, uh, to protect our tech. Um, the other, the other uh, part of uh, why these um, are trending is that I think that uh, the democratic process in general um, winds up just including um, more stakeholders. And when I was thinking about uh, this panel and preparing um, a discussion about the vertical separation of powers, I kept coming back to um, Federalist 10, uh, Madison's uh, arguments about the factions. I think um, now that I'm mentioning the Federalist Papers, we all have to take a sip of our coffee, I think is the rule <laughs> at Federal Society um, events. Um, but the argument there is that when you have um, different factions with different priorities, that the best way to make sure that those are represented is to have those factions spar. Make sure that you have as many voices as possible, make sure that the best are represented by the best people who can carry those messages forward, and then you'll wind up with a result that really does reflect the will and the body of the people. And so, again, there's not a formula to whether local control is always the right answer, uh, state control, or in some other aspects of uh, tech, federal control, like with AVs, for instance, in some areas. Um, but the fact that the various factions have interest at various levels means that the more voices you have in a room and the more stakeholders are heard, the better uh, typically the result winds up being. Um, and statewide uh, regulation tends to involve not just the voices of the business um, that'll wind up being regulated, but of course also the local uh, regulators and the local control who more typically has occupied that space until a statewide uh, law comes into effect. Um, so then in terms of um, Uber's experience when it comes to uh, preemptive laws, it's interesting in this time of great deregulation and, and uh, you know, reg slayers in the federal uh, government, um, I'm so proud that we've sought regulation um, and that we've been, we've, we've looked for authorization and regulation in so many places. Um, it's really changed uh, the landscape, um, and it's made it so that not only are we able to better communicate with the folks that are involved in our business, like <coughs> riders and drivers, um, but it's also paved the way to have better relationships with our regulators. Um, in a lot of instances, again, my background um, at Uber is in the Northeast, um, and a lot of those places, there's a lot of PTSD um, on the part of regulators who um, you know, there were, there, were, there were a lot of back and forth about how, how the local rules should be uh, implemented, how they should be instituted. Um, and I, I know that in some instances we didn't make it um, as easy as we could have um, to be friends um, on the earlier stages. But now that there is formal authorization in so many places, we're making a real effort to make sure that we are uh, mending some relationships and um, really communicating with the local regulators who are much closer to what the actual action is and to our, in most cases, actually enforcing uh, the laws that are now on the books. Um, the goal when, when those uh, laws pass um, from our perspective, again, is to, do, is to balance the safety aspects um, and to balance the opportunity. Um, those laws, the elements typically, there's always a background check provision that, um, that satisfies or that lists out the criteria for background checks. There's always um, language about insurance, how that should work when it comes to ride sharing where it's not always uh, intuitive or it's not always clear how that will, uh, how that will work or how the, how the uh, insurance levels will be controlled. Um, and then finally, there's always language about things like uh, non-discrimination policies, about zero tolerance complaints um, for anybody driving under the influence, um, et cetera. Um, the rules also always defer to local laws when it comes to traffic um, and other types of um, patterns that are, that are uh, naturally uh, local. Um, we would never uh, try to uh, preempt or change the way local traffic patterns go. Um, and typically where there is, um, where there's a, a robust system of regulation like in an airport um, or in a lot of uh, big cities like Philadelphia and New York where there is um, where there is a local, a very uh, developed and robust local control <coughs> over um, for hire vehicles, 
um, and other types of transportation. Uh, typically, those state laws include uh, a lot of language that, that actually covers uh, how the city might be different from how the rest of the state um, operates in terms of the rules that apply um, to Uber. Um, once we pass those rules, another one of the goals that we have is always to start partnering as much as we can with the local um, areas. In Miami, we've had a first mile, last mile partnership that's been um, huge um, and hugely successful that we're really proud of. Um, we've done, um, in Florida and across the country, we're doing a lot of um, uh, efforts to help uh, combat human trafficking. Um, so once, we, once we're authorized and we're able to have more constructive conversations about now that we're here to stay, what will our relationship look like? Then we can start really getting into it and trying to make sure that we're really improving and working uh, for the people in the areas that we're, that we're serving. Um, and then finally, um, when it comes to uh, why those uh, laws for us, uh, why we typically support preemptive laws, um, is that the reliability, the consistency are huge. Uh, last night, um, Administrator uh, Administrators Pruitt um, and Acosta talked about uh, consistency and investment. Um, and again, those are a huge part of what it is that we need to be able to really grow and expand. Um, and for, for riders and drivers as well, if you have an option to get to work that you can't be sure is going to get you there every day, then you'll find a different option. It needs to be reliable to, in order to use it. Um, same thing for drivers. Your car is your second largest investment typically after your home. Um, to invest in a vehicle that winds up, you know, that'll be Uber compliant or that'll be TNC compliant. Um, those are things that people need to consider and not everybody can afford to do that without being sure that they'll be able to continue providing those rides and continue being able to work in the way that they expect <coughs> to do so when they make the investment. Um, so it's helpful to have uh, laws that are, um, that are uh, both uh, wide ranging um, and that are difficult to change. Um, when you have a patchwork of local ordinances, it can be really difficult if, for instance, um, background check criteria differs from city to city or from municipality to municipality. Um, in some places, to get from the airport to downtown, you pass through five or six different jurisdictions in some states. Um, and it can be really difficult if there's different pricing um, uh, regulations or pricing uh, restrictions in the ordinances to make sure that we're, that we're reflecting what those uh, requirements are. Um, the statewide preemption does um, help us make sure that we are giving, um, that we're investing in a service that will wind up being uh, compliant, workable, and reliable um, over time. Um, and, uh, and finally, um, the, the, the last reason why uh, preemptive laws tend to be uh, much more um, helpful for a business investment is that they're just harder to change. Um, local ordinances have, because they are fewer voices, fewer stakeholders, and fewer factions, um, and typically the process is much easier to make changes to those. We've seen in some states ordinances change without much notice um, at all. Um, and it can be really difficult when suddenly uh, the baseline is just different than it was the day before um, without having had an opportunity to engage or discuss. Um, when it comes to statewide rules, um, they're very difficult to change typically, and they typically do engage all of the stakeholders who are involved. Um, and so it does allow um, for a longer term expectation about what the baseline will look like, um, which again helps both the business side and the smaller business side, which is, uh, of course, uh, the drivers. Um, and, and riders who are relying on this. Um, so uh, those, are the, those are the pieces of um, our business, my business perspective, um, having observed um, the, the way that uh, state laws have passed and been implemented um, in many, many states across the uh, East Coast. Um, and want to reemphasize that there's, there really is no formula. There's no, there's no uh, right way that that's always true. Um, but the, it has been really helpful working with um, state and local regulators to make sure that we're, that we're reflecting the right uh, balance as much as we can. Thank you. Um, I think I just heard you say that you liked being regulated by states. Something like that. I hope we'll have some questions about that. Um, Not next, cities. Right. I, that's right. That's right. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dan Nordby. Well, thank you again. Um, so uh, as, as Judge Barber mentioned, I won't be speaking for the governor here today. But uh, for those of you who, who were here last night, you heard the governor express his longtime commitment to the principles of the Federalist Society, separation of powers, and, and limited constitutional government. And uh, I will say it's truly a pleasure to work for a governor who's committed to those principles. Uh, it's probably 
no coincidence that those principles are also present in the governor's legal office. So uh, much as, uh, as, as my colleague in the Solicitor General's office did, I want to recognize a couple of the lawyers from my office who, who are here today. Um, there's uh, uh, something that happens during the State of the Union address where a uh, designated survivor has to be <laughs> named from the cabinet. We had to appoint something like that from the governor's legal <laughs> office to be sure that the governor would not be completely unrepresented should something catastrophic happen here at the Federalist Society. <laughs> So my, my Chief Deputy Jack Heakin is back in Tallahassee, but here today we have uh, John McIver, Meredith Sasso, and uh, Nick Primrose, and uh, they've been provide, working with me to provide excellent counsel to the governor. Um, I also want to express my appreciation to the Solicitor General's office for their uh, tremendous representation of Governor Scott in the Ayala case and in a number of other cases, uh, high-profile cases implica implicating constitutional and important civil principles. Uh, it's uh, been very well represented and we've had some, some outstanding results, so thank you. Um, so as a, uh, my, my task on this panel is to try to put a bow on some of the vertical separation of powers discussion that we've had so far from the city perspective, from the regulated industry persp perspective. And as a matter of policy, it probably won't be a shocking disclosure to say that I generally support the vertical separation of powers set forth in the United States Constitution. And uh, like probably most in this room, uh, I'm generally inclined toward allowing space for local decision making. Uh, whether you characterize this as federalism uh, between state and federal governments, allowing for laboratories of democracy, subsidiarity, uh, the principle that the more uh, remote the government regulator, the less likely it is to take into account the preferences, even the differing preferences of a locality's citizens, I think is a very important one. Uh, Florida is not California, thank goodness, uh, and their citizens may have wildly different priorities on how they would like to, uh, to uh, organize their affairs. So I would say let Florida be Florida. Uh, at the same time, as Kat mentioned, there's also, it's also, I think, undeniable that there are some concrete policy benefits, both for businesses and individuals, in having a uniform regulatory structure over a broader geographic area. Uh, we don't license physicians or lawyers in Florida on a county-by-county county or city-by-city city basis for very good reason. Uh, even though the day-to-day -day practice of law or medicine is going to be very different in Aventura and Apalachicola, um, statewide licensure of professions allows people the freedom to move from one place to another to practice their trade uh, without having to apply to separate regulatory bodies in every, each and every city or mul at multiple lev levels of government. Businesses too, as, as Kat mentioned in the case of Uber, can be incredibly burdened themselves if their operations depend on complying with a multitude or conflicting local ordinances and their consumers as well can, uh, can face difficulties. As an as a, uh, enthusiastic early adopter of the Uber platform, I, I myself found it frustrating as a consumer that I could fly into for, for quite a while Miami International Airport and get an Uber to a hotel. If I flew into uh, to Fort Lauderdale, How Hollywood, uh, I couldn't do that. Uh, so some uniformity in the consumer experience as well as from the business perspective I think can be helpful. So, Where's the right place to resolve that tension between local regulation and uniformity? Uh, does it differ if we're talking about the distinction between state and federal government as opposed to state and local government? And uh, just as importantly, who gets to decide where that line is drawn? Um, I assume this audience will indulge me if I think that the, the most important place to look for those answers is the written text of the federal and state constitutions. So let's, uh, let's start there. Uh, if you look at the federal constitution uh, and compare the intrastate allocation of powers under the state constitution with the division of powers vertically under the federal constitution, Article 1, Section 1 of the federal constitution states that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. And of course, Article 1 goes on to identify several specific legislative powers granted to the Congress in the Constitution to coin money, to declare war, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. But the structure of Article I establishes itself that those are discrete and identified powers vested in the Congress. If that were 
in any way unclear, uh, the Tenth Amendment, I think, should dispel that confusion. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people, end quote. I'm glad that Kat went with Federalist 10. Uh, I was going to go with Federalist 45. Uh, as James Madison put it, uh, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. So the federal Constitution sets up a system wherein the states have the majority of powers unless the federal Constitution specifically grants that regulatory authority to the Congress. So by way of comparison, the Florida Constitution in Article 3, Section 1, provides that, quote, the legislative power of the state shall be vested in a legislature of the state of Florida consisting of a Senate composed of one senator elected from each senatorial district and a House of Representatives composed of one member elected from each representative district, end quote. So it's not the, the legislative power herein granted, but the legislative power of the state vested in the Florida legislature. The Florida Constitution then provides for the state to be divided by law, by law passed by the legislature, into political subdivisions called counties, which may be created, abolished, or changed by law. And Article 8, Section 1F of the Constitution provides that non-charter counties shall have such power of self-government as is provided by general or special law. As to charter counties, the Florida Constitution provides that charter counties shall have all powers of local self-government not inconsistent with general law enacted by the legislature or with special law approved by a vote of the electors. <laughs> Municipal governments, too, in Florida are recognized in the Constitution to have governmental, corporate, and proprietary powers to enable them to conduct municipal government, perform municipal functions, and render municipal services, and may exercise any power for municipal purposes except as otherwise provided by law. So the, courts, uh, the court cases interpreting these home rule provisions that apply to county governments and municipal governments uh, liberally construe home rule power, the home rule power that is inherent in those local governments. But in every case, the clear text of the Constitution provides that local power is still subject to express preemption by the state government. So on the, the underlying question of where that line is to be drawn between allowing local regulation and providing for some manner of uniformity and certainty to businesses and, and regulated parties, uh, I think the differences between the state and federal constitutions are significant. Um, as between the federal government and the state government, I think there's a, a good basis to prefer most decision making to happen at the state level rather than at the federal level, unless there's some reason for the federal government to be acting in an area, and unless the, the federal power is being exercised under some power expressly granted to the federal government by the text of, the, of Article One, Section uh, Article One of the Constitution. Uh, Florida's state government, in contrast, was not created by an agreement among sovereign counties which delegated limited powers to the state legislature. So I think that difference in, in historical practice and in the constitutional text is significant. <coughs> uh, the state constitution provides that all legislative, all legislative powers vested in the legislature and local government powers are required to be not inconsistent with general law. So the debate over local or state control as a policy matter, I think, is an important one to have. <laughs> Uh, I think the ultimate decision makers uh, who should be making those decisions under the Florida Constitution are, uh, are our legislator, I see Chair Renner here in the front row, other legislators present. Uh, the legislature and the governor acting at the state level should be having that good policy debate over preemption, not preemption, what degree of preemption should be present, and that's probably the most appropriate way to, uh, to address the question. Thank you. Okay, at this point, um, the panel started late and we're getting close to the lunch hour. At this point, I'd really like to just go to questions. Does anyone have any questions for any of the panelists, uh, that, that anything that's been said? Um, usually the line is very long for these questions. I assume since this is close to lunch, nobody wants to ask a question to slow everybody else down. Well, and because of the clarity of the panel. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, let me throw something out for the panel to discuss, <laughs> if, you're, if you're so inclined. Um, we think of separation of powers as, um, one way we think of it is the executive enforces the laws, the legislature makes the laws, uh, the, the judicial branch 
um, also participates in interpreting and enforcing the laws. We have a situation in Florida that's developing where the legislature itself is going into court to try to enforce the laws that it's enacting. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about that? Um, I don't know if that's new and novel or that's been going on all along and, and uh, I just wasn't aware of it. Uh, does anyone understand uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the issue that I'm trying to get at? Because it is a pending case in Tampa where the state legislature has filed um, something regarding the uh, local taxation. So I don't want to talk about a pending case, but that's the general issue that I'm, and it's not my case, it's one of my colleagues. Amit, do you have anything on that? No, it's not, it's not really an issue that I'm too knowledgeable about. I think I'd be interested in hearing if maybe the other panelists have more information about that than me. I understand. <laughs> I mean, uh, Dan. I'll, 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 briefly, I mean, I, th I think it is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I think what we've seen historically in Florida when a, uh, when an elected official or a branch of government has filed some sort of an action, an original action in the Supreme Court, it's often been filed uh, on behalf of a legislative chamber and by the uh, Speaker of the House or President of the Senate acting in their individual capacity. And the courts have oftentimes said uh, that because of Florida's broad standing laws in some of those cases that uh, whether or not the, le the legislative <coughs> body or the state agency would itself have standing, uh, the individual members would have standing as individuals. So they've kind of sidestepped it. The federal case, I think, is, uh, is, has historically been uh, much more skeptical of the idea that a legislator or a legislative chamber has the, uh, the right to go into court to, to uh, to advocate that the legislative power ordinarily would be executed through traditional legislative functions of oversight, uh, impeachment, appropriations decisions. So I, I think to some degree it, it may be a, a new phenomenon, but uh, we'll, we'll see in some of these in some of these pending cases how that plays out. Yeah, it's actually somewhat of a cutting edge issue as far as I can tell. I just don't remember that happening. Not that it can't or it shouldn't, but just hasn't um, thus far. Now. Um, Another issue that, that's sort of been discussed having to do with the idea of what do we do if a local official is not enforcing the laws that have been, act, have been enacted, duly enacted by the state legislature. That was touched on on, on the, the, uh, the death penalty situation, but there was a statute, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a statute involved that allowed the governor to act, yes? Yeah, Florida statute 27.14. Look at that, he has it memorized. Yeah. Um, what if there isn't a statute? What if there isn't a statute? Does the panel have any feeling about that? If, if a, you know, a local actor just simply doesn't agree with the law and just not going to enforce it, is is the is the the, the remedy just elections, or should, is there some something else that can or should be done? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I mean, the, the, there is some uh, some authority. Uh, in the governor's office to suspend elected officials, both statutory and constitutional, for uh, for certain after they've been indicted with certain crimes. There's also some general misfeasance or malfeasance language that, under certain circumstances, may be applicable. Um, but that's that's also a fairly rare phenomenon in the absence of uh, of an indictment. Okay. But that suspension component that that statutorily granted, correct? I mean, well, it's yeah, it's in the Constitution. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's the Constitution yeah. well, as, to, as to some yes, elected right. officers and uh, for municipal officers, um, some statutory provisions. And, and I think traditionally there's been a great hesitance on the part of upstream uh, authority to interfere. And it, again, talking about the Ayala case, it, there were a lot of unusual convergences, one chief among them being uh, a limited time in which a candidate uh, for state attorney could say, uh, well, we really don't have a death penalty law right now, uh, and, and, and thus not having expressed that. But without the concomitant, at least in that case, um, statement by the elected official that they weren't going to follow the law. I mean, I, I, I think that makes this a really rare circumstance, and, and otherwise, Fortunately. Um, it, yes, otherwise, I'm, I'm guessing it would be difficult for a governor's office to act in a way that might be perceived as interceding with the wishes of the electorate. And similarly, at the JQC, 
one of the things we constantly worry about is here is a judge that has been properly put on the bench and in the event of election of that judge, the, the people of that place have said, we want this person um, functioning in this community as this kind of judge. And so we're very, very hesitant to interfere with that. So I, I think you have kind of natural limitations that occur. Have you seen a situation, Mayan, at the Judicial Qualifications Commission, the commission or committee? Commission? Commission. Where, where a judge has simply said, I'm just not following these laws, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'm elected. I can do what I want to do. Have you seen anything like that? Uh, well, by the time we uh, have them in the room with us, they are speaking a little differently than they, they changed their maybe minds. had previously yes. worked. <laughs> I sometimes say that uh, you can almost see the light bulb go off uh, about halfway around the room as the commission members question uh, a judge about the behavior that brought that judge there. Um, but actually, in the context of the commission, um, refuse, well, let's don't say refusals, let's say the failure to follow the law, uh, irrespective of the intent, um, is something that the appellate courts are very well uh, set out to handle, and there's a process and a procedure. And uh, it works pretty well in Florida throughout the state. Our concern is more um, if, if the electorate knew of an issue uh, about a judge that some of us might say, do you want a judge engaging in this behavior? You might say objectively, no. But if the electorate knew, because it was public information, and saw and understood the debate about it or the uh, contrariness of the issue or, and, and elected the judge, that's just something we look at very, very carefully vis-a-vis -vis the judicia, judicial canons because a lot of the judges we see, not a lot, a few of the judges we see, nobody in here would want making certain decisions, frankly, particularly from low population areas where it's just a different, you know, different setup. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not our place to substitute our desire and point of view and will vis-a-vis uh, -vis the electorate. Okay. Well, I don't see anyone with any questions. I see some, there's, is Judge Shepard have a question? Or is he getting up to go to lunch? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I think he's got a question. That'll teach you to stand Seriously. up, right? <laughs> you know, this is such a quiet audience. Uh, quite, quite, so I do have a question, a variation on uh, separation of powers. Uh, so my question is, is this on? My question is. Can, can everyone hear him? No. no. Speak loudly, please. Give me that microphone. No. No, no, no. No, no, no. Get, get closer. My question, my question is, <laughs> what, what does this panel think? about the uh, maxim or, uh, or uh, mantra of uh, judicial deference by uh, state departments and agencies to interpretations of statutes and rules um, by agencies that they are charged to, to enforce judicial deference. Uh, all of the panel members, I think, might be interested in the subject. Uh, I don't mean to pick on anybody, but the uh, executive branch uh, uh, might. Uh, uh, I'd like to know how, how, how much the executive branch likes the idea and whether the government over there will support it. Maybe, maybe even the judge will respond. Well, th this, thank you for that question, Judge Shepard. <laughs> Who would like to take on that, uh, that, that topic? The Chevron question, right? I'll take, I'll take a step. Uh, and let me reiterate, speaking only for myself. Um, uh, as long as I am uh, an attorney representing executive branch agencies, I hope the judiciary affords great deference to the interpretations of statutes um, adopted by those agencies. Uh, I think it's an interesting debate, though, more seriously. I know Judge Shepard has been uh, intimately involved in a uh, proposed amendment to the Florida Constitution that I believe is on the floor of the Constitution Revision Commission that would provide that uh, 
courts are to accord no deference to the views of state agencies in interpreting laws. Um, and that is a debate that uh, if, the, if the CRC, if 22 members see fit to put that on the ballot, that I'm sure we'll be having to a greater degree than that question has ever been debated before uh, among the electorate of the state of Florida. Dan, are there any other CRC issues out there that would be uh, relevant to the separation of powers thing? Any, anybody on the panel can think of anything? I'm not aware of them, but do we have any members here? Any CRC members with us? No? Yeah, All right. Preemption one's good. Yeah. Not really? All right. Well, thank you for that question, Judge Shepard. And I think that's the last question, and it is about time for us to break for lunch. Thank you very much.